We spend somewhere around an hour interrogating the soldiers. Apparently an order had been relayed all across the Mojave that NCR troopers were no longer to engage in hostilities with the Brotherhood of Steel. Instead, they were ordered to capture and hold anyone accused of being an Enclave agent or an Enclave sympathizer. Literally, if any player were to even mention us without a hateful tone, a mod would arrest them through NCR MPs and interrogate them. Mods thought we were trying to persuade neutral players to join us through PMs. If we can't metagame you, we'll just attack everyone who may or may not be on your side. I shit you not, a few of the strip players and one or two of the traveling traders were arrested for not shit-talking us in-game. They were winning over the people for us. After we got finished figuring out what was happening in character and out of character, we tried deciding on what to do with the NCR prisoners. You said it yourself, Peter. The Enclave doesn't take prisoners. My character was sitting in a chair deliberating on what we could do with them. Volp and Conrad were both advocating for their executions and I wouldn't want to do otherwise. But this was no time for destroying your enemies. This was a time for politics and messages. I know you want them to die. I do too. But think about the message we could send to the Mojave if we played this out correctly. Conrad and Volp sit beside me to try and figure out my meaning. The people of the Mojave have taken notice to our actions and are completely associating all of us with the Enclave. Even though among us there is only one true Enclave representative. I pause to draw a square in the dirt with a Volp spear. I cut out a small rectangle where Bonnie Springs and Good Springs would be located. If you don't know by now, I plan on killing every Powder Ganger in Prim. So, I make a dotted line around where Prim would be. This is our sphere of influence. They know, or will know, that we aren't here to slaughter and destroy everything in our path. Mr. New Vegas is a respectable and well-known host. People heed his word with truth and seek him out for knowledge. We've been mentioned once for our good deeds, especially the Enclave has been mentioned. No doubt we've earned some goodwill with the populace, but we need to make the people look to us for protection. Most of all, we need to make people see us as heroes. Though I do believe we are heroes of a different caliber. Years of lies and propaganda have filled even the deepest ears among the American population with bullshit and villainous fantasy. Luckily, the NCR and BUS have no clue as to how the true Americans won their power. Outnumbered and afraid, they played to their enemy's advantages without violence but with politics. We will nurse the prisoners to walking health, then we will send them to the Mojave outpost. While Volt leaned back, trying to take it all in, Conrad moved closer and whispered to me. But why would we do that? It could end badly for anyone we send to escort the prisoners. I smiled and patted Conrad on the shoulder. Thank you for not questioning me openly. It may have set an example of disobedience for the men. I stood to my feet and paced in front of my two companions. No matter what happens, if we go through with my plan, we will win. If our men aren't attacked, it will be seen as a metaphorical weakness on the NCR's part. We spared the lives of the NCR's finest and returned them in the best condition we could. Ah, we didn't even torture them. So when they return, they will speak of our deadly strategies and our brisk operational efficiency. I mean, who else could take out an NCR camp without suffering a single fatal casualty? Both Volp and Conrad were beginning to understand what I was going for. Volp decided to speak up. 
What if they do attack our men? And kill them? I only smiled and turned to our ragtag soldiers who were rummaging through the NCR's bags and supplies. While it will be a sacrifice I do not wish to make, it will serve as a truth for the Mojave to behold. We will have extended a hand of mercy and possible peace to the NCR, who so readily threatens and incarcerates anyone who doesn't hate us. Our hand will be bitten by the bear, and we shall never extend a hand of mercy again, and no one will care if we slaughter a thousand surrendering NCR soldiers. They will have openly refused our kindness and attacked soldiers who came to parley with a gift of goodwill. I pause to take in a breath of the warm evening air. Well, if they kill our men and mask it with the lie of us attacking first, NCR politicians aren't afraid to lie. I smiled and turned to Volt. We'll be sending your two youngest recruits. We'll call them cadets. We will see to it that they take twice as long as it should to arrive at the outpost. They will be dressed in the most obvious uniforms possible. I want to make sure that everyone they pass knows who they are and what they're doing. Say the NCR does say that our cadets attacked first. How many potential witnesses would have seen just two young boys guarding injured NCR soldiers? You're too smart for your own good, Peter. If you aren't careful, you'll accidentally become president someday. The three of us laughed heartily. That night we ate, drank, and slept soundly. For four months we had been on the run from the powers in this inhospitable wasteland. This was the most relaxing night in all that time. And we slept a few feet away from dead bodies. As dawn came, we were already wide awake and brimming with energy. I had made it clear the night before that we were going to attack the Powder Gangers in Prim and kill them all. Effectively, we would win them over like Bonnie and Good Springs. The only issue is that we had 12 NCR prisoners to guard. Exactly how we would keep them from running away and staying at full operational efficiency, I had yet to figure out. What if we left a few of your robots here to guard them? Robots are extra trigger happy, so it should keep them in check. I shook my head and stood to my feet. Even the troopers don't know the full strength of the powder gangers in this town. We will need to have all assets under our control for this operation to be successful. Hypothetically, at least. What do you mean, hypothetically? I fiddled with my pistol, then turned to Volp. He was a semi-skilled strategist and always tried understanding the actions or tactics dictated by others. You see, if we have all our assets at the ready, instead of being occupied, we have the full possibility of liquidating our tactics and reassuring the situation as the tides of battle dictate. Volp nods and sets down a bottle of water he was sipping at. I got an idea that most likely would work, but only if it was executed correctly. We can, however, try to guess our enemy's strengths and weaknesses. One thing we know about the Powder Gangers is that they've been restricted to small arms and industrial grade explosives. I might have a strategy able to nullify both their weapon groups, but we'd better fucking learn to huddle like penguins. What are penguins? Are you sure this will work? Your robots are pretty fucking stupid. I turned my head to Conrad and just smiled. We had lined up the Igors in a tight wedge formation. One leader and three on either side of him. Me, Jackal, Conrad, and the farmers were inside this open wedge. The plan was to leave two of the recruits with the prisoners. Volt would ambush the Powder Gangers from the south with Richardson while we hit them from the west. 
I could easily repair any minor damage to the Igors, but I couldn't replace human lives. As we began moving after we had already crossed the bridge, we heard the confused talking of the powder gangers. Initiate Propaganda Protocol 34. The Igors begin broadcasting a recorded file off in unison. We are the Enclave. Stay in your homes. The threat will be neutralized momentarily. God bless America. I turned to everyone with me and said, On the third time the audio loops, rise up and start shooting these fuckers. As the second loop came to an end, Igor started shooting at the powder gangers. They in return began shooting back. 9mm ricocheted off of the hull of the leftmost robot, and one of the farmers almost pissed himself. Calm it down, just wait. Third loop came near its end, and in the final syllable, we all raised up and unleashed hell on the nearest of the powder gangers. One of the farmers blew one guy's head off. A few seconds later, they were all dead. Jackal darted out from behind the Protectrons and over towards a building's corner. I only realized after he took the kill shot that there was a sniper on top of the hotel directly ahead of us. Good shot kid, but next time call that shit out so one of us don't get shot. Jackal just nodded at me and got back with our wedge formation. I scanned around the streets, surveying the am amount of dead bodies. I turn to my left and see Richardson in a dead sprint towards us. Behind him is Vulp and the recruits. I may have forgot to mention, but it had been four months since I adopted Richardson. In that time, he's grown exceptionally larger. Before, he was about my height. Now he stood two or three feet over me. Did you encounter any powder gangers from the south entrance? Vulp didn't reply to me, but turned his gaze to Richardson, who was picking cloth out of his teeth. I nodded and patted Richardson's belly. Good boy. Let's go get dessert. Peter, what's that supposed to mean? I turned to Conrad, then point to the hotel. There was a sniper on top of that building's roof, which means there are men inside making sure the sniper doesn't get flanked. Let's go and pay them a visit. Just before I could start giving orders, Richardson snapped his neck to the left and began prowling towards a car hood propped up against a brick wall. Before anyone could say a word, I shushed them and followed Richardson closely. Richardson was easily the most intelligent wild deathclaw I had ever seen. God knows what he'd be capable of with a neural unit. Once we got close enough to the hood, Richardson slipped his claw over the top of it and pulled it just enough towards him so that he could peer inside. He was met with a high-pitched barking. What the fuck, that PNG? I tap Richardson and point for him to go away. I put my hand on the hood and pull it away from the building. Sitting there staring at me was a little boy who wasn't even ten and a young dog who was gripping tightly. Are you alright son? I don't know why I asked, he just kept staring at me. I turned to Conrad. Find me some sweets or a soda or something, it's a kid. Conrad started going from person to person, seeing if they had anything I could use to get the kid to come out. Eventually, Jackal gives up a nuka cola. More correctly, he got a gut punch, and Conrad took the cola. He handed the soda to me, and I looked back at the kid. Are you thirsty? He nodded at me weakly. I showed him the cola, and he lit up like a Christmas tree. Come on out so we can talk and it's all yours. For a few seconds the kid didn't move but he slowly began crawling out from behind the hood. Once he was out from behind the hood he put his dog down who had been leashed to his wrist with a thin rope. 
I squatted down and popped the cap off the Nuka Cola and handed it to the boy. So what's your name, buddy? He started gulping down the pop, but stopped and wiped his mouth with the sugary drink. Bradley. I smiled at him and looked at him a tad confused. What are you doing out here while all these criminals are around, Bradley? He stopped drinking again to answer me. I had to get sticks. I smiled and chuckled. Is that the name of this little guy? He smiled back at me and did a quick nod. You're a brave little boy to go get your puppy. Very responsible too. Where is everyone? He gulped down the last of the pop, then set the bottle down on the concrete. He turned and pointed at the building across the street. The Vicky and Vance Casino, huh? Are your parents in there? He nodded to me and wiped the sweat off his brow. Well, how about we go see them? Would you like to do that? Conrad, take Bradley's puppy. I'll carry him. Let's go see how the people of Prim are faring under NCR protection. When we walked through the doors of the casino, we were met with blinding light, and a dozen voices telling us all to put our hands up at once. We of course did not comply. We only waited for the people to notice Bradley. We heard the dropping of a rifle and watched as a man ran forward. I set the boy down and he ran into the man's arms. A few seconds later a woman came and joined in the love fest. For a whole minute they were just loving and telling the boy how much they worried. Eventually they turned off the floodlights. The father looked up to thank us but only gasped at the realization that we were the enclave they had heard so much about. Everyone else in the casino realized it too. At this time, Conrad put the dog down and it ran over to the family. The father stood up and approached me. He shook my hand and was about to start talking when one of the people behind him said loudly, It's the Enclave. The father ignored the person and thanked me for saving his son. Everyone listen to me because I'll only be saying it once. We are the Enclave. Any rumors you've heard about us being heartless murderers is a fiction beyond comprehension. But the time for talking is not upon us. We know some of the powder gangers are in the hotel. Stay back and let us do our job. We'll deal with them quickly.